Welcome back to the International Teacher Education Network Conference, or ITEN 2022. We are very excited to have you join us online. You are in the panelist discussion entitled New Paradigm in Education. Recording in progress. In the post-COVID-19 era. My name is Pong Papan Pung So Pong, or you just call me Pong. Um, I am a faculty member uh, of uh, the Faculty of Education, Gesetzat University, and I will be the moderator of this session. Uh, first, I would like to uh, introduce our uh, panelists. We have four panelists here uh, in this session, okay? First, Professor Teng Seng Chang from the Department of Education and Human Potential Development, National Donghua University, Taiwan. Professor Chang was born in Yilan, Taiwan. He received his BA in Chinese literature in 1988 and MS and PhD in education from the University of North Texas, USA in 1991 and 1996, respectively. Professor Chang's main interest has focused on educational psychology, university classroom experience, inter interdisciplinary uh, learning, gender equity, and LGBT education. Professor Chang is a current member of broad of the Taiwanese Feminist Scholars Association, and he is also active members of several academic societies, including international, a Congress uh, of uh, Psychology, American Psychology Association or APA, and uh, American Educational Research Association or AERA. Second panelist, Dr. Nino uh, D. Nadoza from Institute of Knowledge Management, Philippines, Normal University, the Philippines. He graduated his Doctoral, doctorate and master degree in educational management at PUP Star Misa of Manila and graduate certificate in distant education from University of the Philippines, Open University. He is the current director of the Institute of Knowledge Management and concurrent head of the School of Information and Knowledge Management at the Philippines at Philippine Normal University, Manila. He is responsible managing um, the undergrad and graduate uh, program at PMU on educational technology and library information science. Third, uh, we have uh, assistant professor, Dr. Uh, Udom Laks Kunsi Road from Department of Education is a University. Dr. Udom Lak is, a, is an assistant professor and also an associate dean for international affairs at the Faculty of Education, Gesetzar University, where she teaches diversity and equity in education, leadership in curriculum and instruction development, languages and cultures for teachers, before teaching at KU, she was a teacher of English for 13 years at Kasesa University Laboratory School, Center for Educational Research and Development. She received her BA in English from Jialongkorn University and MA in ling Appai Linguistic and Doctor of Education in Curriculum and Instruction from Kasesa University. Her research interests include scaffolding technique, teacher professional development, and diversity and equity in education. Fourth and the last panelist is Associate Professor Theo Tangwi. Professor Tangwi uh, is the Associate Professor at Natural, Natural Sciences and Science Education, National Institute of Education, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. She is the co-head of the multi-centric education research and industry STEM center at uh, NIE. 
and she pursued her PhD in, in curriculum and instruction at the, at the University of Illinois Urbana Campaign, Champaign, USA. Prior to her doctoral studies, she was a chemistry teacher in a high school and a, a specialized STEM school for gifted mathematics and science students. Her research focused on issue on inclusivity in classroom with under achievers and students with special education needs. In, 2000, in 2021, she received her he re, she received Asia Pacific Science Education Base Paper Award for her paper about special needs science education. She also studied gender issue in STEM education and has published her work in UNESCO report and OECD forum network. Tang Wee is the editor-in-chief of Journal Research in Integrated STEM Education. To all panelists, I would like you to uh, share your idea on uh, the theme of the conference. We talk about the new paradigm in education. Uh, after in in the in the post COVID nineteen era, and I have three guiding questions for you. Okay, um, the first one, in your perspective, whether and how COVID nineteen pandemics have affected teacher education in your field. Second, what is the lesson learned from the crisis? Any hope or opportunity for high quality COVID nineteen affected? or online teacher education? And what is it like doing research when the coronavirus outbreak has hit your country? Each of you will be given 10 minutes to uh, at, uh, answer all these three questions. And I will be the timekeeper and I will notify you about the time limit. So let's start with Professor Chan. Okay. Um, okay. So, can everyone see my screen, my PPT? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, how about how about this one? Yes. Okay. Good. Great. Okay. Uh, Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, um, I would like to share my experience about um, like the teacher education in the post COVID-19 era in Taiwan. And my name is, okay, my Thai name is Chang Elephant. Okay, because my last name, the pronunciation of my last name is Chang and my Thai student told me it's Elephant. So you can call me Elephant for this session. Okay, and um, as the, the host said, we have uh, three key questions. So I will mainly focus on three questions, but I also like to give a brief introduction about the background uh, about the COVID-19 in Taiwan. And I also like to share some reflection from my uh, personal per se. Well, back to 2020, the pandemic have a small impact in Taiwan compared to another industrialized countries. So with a small number, for example, like a total of seven deaths. So Taiwan's handling of the outbreak had received international praise for its effectiveness in quarantine people. Okay, so, um, we, I mean, the Taiwanese were quite happy in 2020. However, an outbreak among the Taiwanese crew member of the state on China airline in late April 2021 led to a sharp surge in case. So mainly the great Taipei area. So in response to this situation, the government decided to you know, close all the school. Okay, so from the middle of May, to the end of September 2021. So this five months long distance teaching has a strong impact on the practice courses that require face-to-face -face classes. Okay. So 
my talk today were based on what happened in these five months in Taiwan. Okay, and regarding to the first question is about what's the impact. Okay, I will say the curriculum and the instruction. And then the second one is student engagement. So as we know, the COVID-19 pandemic has greatly affected the two important aspects in teacher education in my field, curriculum instruction and the student engagement. Okay, and the curriculum part, as we know, we have, you know, a, due to the sudden shift from the traditional face-to-face -face learning to online blended learning. So the curriculum must instantly be adjusted to make it more flexible for students and for teachers as well. So in speaking of instruction part, yes, this, this is evident for delaying the opening of the cases and exclude some outcomes that cannot be covered through online learning. So instruction was challenging since it required innovative and efficient learning approaches, which should cater student teacher capability while responding to each learner needs. So upgrading and learning new skills in using ICT have caused a, a lot of frustration for teachers, especially for those who belong to gener uh, Generation X. And I'm consider myself as part of a Generation X. And we have a gener and our college student is a Generation Z, and they are facing the gener you know COVID nineteen, so they are generate they are also Generation C. So you can see the instruction is quite a challenge under the co uh, COVID nineteen. And also um, because of the online setting, so student engagement has been difficult to realize since students have not trained to use technology. And most importantly, they do not have a proper equipment. For example, like some of the students online, and then when I, when I ask their question, they say, oh, uh, okay, other students will say, oh, professor, he doesn't have uh, like a headphone or he doesn't have the speaker. So it's not easy for me to ask the student who doesn't have the speaker to answer the question online. And the second issue is about, you know, what is the lesson learned from this crisis, right? And any hope or opportunity? Well, the first one, I will say the sufficient ICT resources is quite, is very, very important, right? And also the high level of educator, dig, uh, digital pedagogy competency have been a big issue, yes. And the second one, I do believe the institution of all types, you know, elementary, even the kindergarten school um, should provide um, adequate ICT resources with effective training for both students and the teachers' digital competence to not only prepare this specific pandemic, but also for the future. And then for the questions three, issue three, um, doing research during the COVID-19, Professor Chang, you turn off your microphone. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, uh, so the data collection was delayed due to restriction, and the desired participant from marginalized community was impossible to reach. Right. For example, most of the education research methods, such as survey, interview, or observation, which might be which have to be carried in person, were impossible to reach out. Okay. And then I skip issue four, issue five, issue six, issue seven, because I want to spend the time on the special issues in Taiwan. Okay, the first one is about unfair issues, unfairness issue due to the level three lockdown, as I mentioned earlier in May, in middle May, 2021. But Taiwan still decided to carry out high school test testing. So what does this reveal about the Taiwanese education system and the importance of press on education in Taiwanese society? And then 
So uh, I said from a paper online, a Taiwanese student attending his first year of the college in September 21, comment that personally from student point of view, the student will say no, it's unfair is because the lockdown began, distant learning is not well adapted and taught among certain city and regions, especially due to techno uh, technological issues. It directly affects student ability to do well in the exam and make less likely for them to have the ab uh, ability to go to the high school or go to the college they desire. And then, the cheating issue, well, I think everyone agree another problem with shifting education online is cheating issue. So we can only image what the rate of inappropriate testing activity is when no one is watching. Okay, and if you ask me, do I have any solution? I apologize, so far I don't have any solution for the cheating issue. Okay, and the last one I like to mention because this is quite a special issue in Taiwan. It's a political issue about Zoom. Okay, we are using the Zoom to communicate online, right? But actually, Zoom banned by Taiwan government. Okay, so it's because of China's security fear. So Taiwanese government said political body, a public body, including the school, should not use product with security ones such as Zoom. But competitors like Google or Microsoft were accepted. Okay, so China considered Taiwan as a breakaway and rebel privacy, this, I mean, distant to be unit with the mainland China. So this is quite, you know, kind of like an interesting issue in Taiwan because a lot of teachers, you know, they, before, before the COVID-19, they get used to, they used to use Zoom, but after the COVID-19, then the government decided if you use Zoom, you have to change your online environment. Yeah, so this is quite like an interesting issue in uh, Taiwan, okay. And also, um, I have some reflection about, you know, the pandemic, um, the post-pandemic in the education era. Okay, the first one is teaching then have changed. We have to face it, right? And the second one, we have to adapt a new way. And what is a new way is full IR, okay, full IR edge. Okay, yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, okay, industrial innovation for Generation Z to see, right? So what's required to visit library before it has been changed. So as a teacher or as, as a faculty member, we have to get aware of this. So the reluctance rise in COVID-19 infection in the country has forced everyone into the full IR age. And then the COVID-19 has forced education sector to be responsible to apparent sign of the new paradigms. So we need to use the um, online experience of online teaching and learning to shape our expectation of what is to, to hold within the education sector post the COVID-19 pandemic. The last one is education leader need to rethink content creation and the content sharing and establish working environment to meet the demands of the new paradigm education. Well, I think I began the time, sorry about that, but that's all my sharing for this panel. Thank you. You are good at the time. Uh, we still, you used to have like one minute. Uh, to go, but anyway, you just stop okay. here, right? Yes. Okay. Or maybe I speak too fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I I skip a question four, five, six, seven. Yes. Okay, so um, there are many interesting in your interesting point uh, in your presentation, and we will keep that uh, in our uh, discussion uh, session uh, section next. Um, so let's start uh, the second panelist, uh, Professor Nino Di Nadosa. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm about to present to you uh, the teacher education at the time of pandemic, the Philippines experience. So let me share my screen. 
can you see my screen now? All right, thank you very much. So as I do my discussion for about 10 minutes, hopefully I could finish that on time. I'll be discussing uh, important points or highlights, particularly on what we've experienced so far in, in the Philippines in the context of our teacher education programs and with our curriculum. So we had been um, restricted with the way how we learn uh, at the time of pandemic because everything must be shifted in terms of structuring the instructional deliveries of our um, of the teaching and learning processes, not only in, in most of the disciplines in the higher education, but also in teacher education programs. We also need to, we also have these initiatives and directions in terms of improving more of our infrastructure, particularly in information technology. As we all know in the Philippines, uh, we have some problems, particularly in terms of internet connectivity and uh, because of our, uh, because of our uh, geographical uh, conditions uh, in the Philippines. We, ha we have about 7,100 islands all in all, and uh, there's a big problem when it comes to internet connectivity, and also in terms of our mobility requirements. As well as uh, the focus has been, uh, has been contextualized on the teacher's preparedness and training. Uh, at, as we started with shifting from the residential face-to-face -face classes to flexible learning or distance education, we come up with a better solution in terms of equipping and upscaling our teachers in terms of their technological proficiencies and technological skills. And that's part of our prep that, that was part of our preparation uh, uh, as the time of pandemic began. And still we, we address that alongside with a teacher preparation would be the digital apples of our student when it comes to technology requirements as well as how they could shift themselves in terms of uh, from the brick and mortar principle of learning to the flexible distance and open education. Uh, concern has been raising at the idea of digital divide. Uh, there's still what we call the digital gap along the way. However, I would like to share to you one of the initiatives of our basic education uh, agency in the Department of Education of the Philippines, where in they come up with this um, fla flagship program or flagship policy. Uh, this is what they call the basic education learning continu continuity plan in the time of COVID-19. And uh, the, the, the Department of Education was tasked or mandated all of the schools in the basic education to provide assistance and to shift in terms of the way classes are being delivered from face-to-face -to, -face to, the, to the modular approach or even to the online open distance situation. When there are four different phases, first would be shifting to face-to-face -to -face for those who local, for those areas or localities having uh, low cases of COVID-19. However, this, this, this was not happened during the first year of pandemic because everything has been shifted totally to, to the context of distance learning. And also the third one would be blended learning, okay, a combination of face-to-face -face and uh, online delivery of courses for those who have high level of high alert levels in terms of COVID-19 community classification and the homeschooling, which is one of the one of uh, the common or the usual practice that we, we, we embedded in our system a uh, long time before. However, it has been well manifested and well practiced during the time of pandemic. Now, I want to share to you the higher education plan. We're in Philippine Normal University as a national center for teacher education. It has been based on the mandate of the Commission on Higher Education in the Philippines, wherein universities, colleges must have their own continuity plan or their own directions in terms of shifting from the usual residential classes to any forms of flexible learning. Flexible learning, the term flexible learning is widely being used in the context, in the Philippine context because we, we it encapsulates all on the ideas of open learning, distance learning, even remote learning as well. So from the directions of the of PNU as one of the of one of the national uh, teacher education institutions in the country, we conducted what we call the curricular modifications and some project modifications in terms of the delivery of our programs. Okay, from laboratory courses to practical courses, more especially to the humanities and social science courses, been shifted, providing our students with different 
different level modality uh, through what we call the term in Tagalog. It means Kawai Aralan sa Bagong Kadawayan. It's the flagship program of the university for PNU Flexible Learning and Teaching Framework. Also, uh, one of the projects of the Philippine National Research Center for Teacher Quality is the production of a framework on pre-service teachers' practice-based training, wherein it, with it encapsulated and provided assistance to teacher education institutions in terms of its shifting uh, to be more flexible in terms of the support mechanism for our pre-service teachers who are undergoing their field study and internship training uh, with our partners in the basic education, wherein there are three, there are four important layers that they had been uh, they had been uh, attributed based on the on the core principles here, encapsulating the field studies, the teaching internship, also the the complementary uh, activities alongside with their teaching internship, teaching experiences, uh, teaching edu teacher education activities, and the professional education courses, wherein. It, it encapsulates all of the elements of being experiential, system-based, developmental, formative, and as well as integrative in terms of the delivery of the curriculum alongside with research production and the trust for having a quality and efficient internship program. I would like to share to you some of the things that has been uh, practiced uh, so far in most of the uh, in most of the teacher education schools in the Philippines uh, at the time of pandemic, wherein the usual face-to-face -face internship program has been shifted to asynchronous and synchronous sessions. One that I would like to highlight here is the context of an action research. It is being a requirement for all of the interns in teacher education to conduct a collaborative classroom-based action research. That's part of their internship program aside from, providing them, aside from providing and producing what we call an electronic portfolio. Okay. In terms of the off-campus program wherein the students are being assigned to different basic education schools, whether it is private or public, still currently, even though we even though the, the Manila, the Manila, which is the capital of the Philippines, has been under the alert level one. One of the lowest alert level of COVID, uh, there is full capacity in most of our uh, in our most of our uh, daily transactions right now. Even in business, in schools are in full capacity. However, some schools are still providing flexible learning in most of the delivery of their programs. Here, um, there's what they call an e-portfolio production, and the in the supervision and the teaching still being observed through synchronous and asynchronous activity uh, anchored we are being assisted with learning management system platforms in terms of the research priorities uh, at the time of pandemic these are some of the of the researches that has been conducted or that has been part of the engagements or, or engagements or activities of the university and we think that these are important uh, as the time of pandemic uh, in terms of how we produce research and how also we how we also manage our researches first would be on product development leading to patenting and commercialization second would be researches on flexible learning there are emerging research priorities that may support flexible learning and it's also our directions okay uh, in most also of our counterpart universities on teacher education to conduct research on flexible learning as well as gender and education is one also of the top is one also of the priority programs of the government as well as teacher education to see how students and uh, our client clientele are working in terms of of its uh, implications or effects of covid-19 pandemic to gender and education last but not the least we have the knowledge management improving of our systems it systems academic and administrative work processes uh that's that's why in in generating and conducting our research we maximize all of our it infrastructures to support the the one of the trust of the faculty in terms of our job as as university professors or as uh, college uh, faculty members aside from doing our job being a teacher in curriculum instruction we are also need to conduct community extension and services and last but not the least with the research production the IT system, the infrastructure requirements heavily relied on data collection, uh, particularly on the use of the different IT platforms like Microsoft, Google, and other software applications to really generate and to, to navigate data later on. 
and distance and open education as one of the priority research in teacher education. These are some of the things that we've been conducting in most of our uh, endeavors. If, as you see on the lower part, um, we have there this, on the first year of, of pandemic, we provided our students with printed modules. There are about, I think, 5,000 copies of, of printed modules to our students in order for them to be supported with, with uh, blended learning. Uh, aside from that, they're provided with flash drives, con which contains all of the of the digital copies or resources that they need for that particular term, okay? And, and support with the learning management systems. Right now, our direction would be going into the in-person classes. There are conversations in the university and not only in PNU, but also in higher education institutions, but in basic education to go with the context of hybrid education and high flex, the combination of hybrid plus flexible learning, but not really going into full online because we still want to go back to, to the real classrooms and we still want to learn more of what universities can offer physically. Uh, lesson learned, uh, particularly on the time of pandemic, is that I would like to go back to the core of, of teaching and learning process and the role of teacher at the, at the time of pandemic. We're in, I, we always believe on the context of having great teacher and having great technology, but this technology is not about being the best technology, but we refer here to have the appropriate technology. And also there are emerging great pedagogies, emerging pedagogies along the way. I think these three elements contribute a lot to provide great teaching experience and also our great learning experience to our learners in the field. So with that, um, here are my references for the discussion. Maraming salamat po and thank you very much. Thank you so much. There are so many interesting points uh, to be asked. Uh, so we will be holding uh, to the uh, discussion se uh, section. Uh, very soon. Okay, so let's move on to uh, the third panelist, uh, Dr. Udom Lak, please. Thank you so much. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, all right. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think that uh, my storytelling, I mean, 10 minutes storytelling will answer all three questions from the moderator. Uh, next, sorry, it doesn't go anywhere. Okay, well, the COVID-19, as every, everyone know that the COVID-19 pandemic has forced sudden transformation uh, in the, the education sector and the sudden transition to online pedagogy has been, uh, I call it the accidental education benefit of COVID-19. But anyway, it has also exposed some inequalities uh, and challenges. And this is what I concern. And this is in accordance with what Professor John William and also Professor Chang has just mentioned before. Well, let's see. And this is, you can see that this is what uh, the sustainable development goal number four, uh, quality education has expected to see. But in reality, you can see that COVID-19 has wiped out 20 years of education gains. And let's see, this is a, a context of Thailand. And I would like to share my experience from working on uh, the, the development of Thai reading and writing skills for children and youth in rural areas project. Uh, this is a collaboration among many institutions. Uh, I mean, Princess uh, Mahajakri Award uh, Foundation, the Thai Red Cross Society, uh, Equitable Education Fund, uh, King Mongkut's University of Technology, Thonburi, and also Kasesat University. Uh, we have been collaborating to enhance this project since June last year. Well, in last year, physical year 2021, uh, we can see that a lot of primary students uh, did not pass the Thai reading and writing test. Uh, well, and this is a, you know, I can say that it is a result from, from uh, the school closures caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and the failures of online and distance learning. 
And on the information on your right hand side, you can see that a lot of there are a lot of I can I can say that I use the word extremely poor students from a family with uh, an average income of less than 90 US dollar per month, I mean per month, who are likely to drop out of school. This is also the information from the equitable education from, uh, fund in Thailand. From this slide, I just want to show that uh, the number of Thai students from extremely poor families is increasing every year. Uh, actually, this information can be applied to the context of faculty of education as well. Uh, we live in a city and sometimes we ignore this fact. Well, the upper picture on the right is evidence uh, of our hard trip to a school in the north of Thailand. Uh, the school is located in, in, in the forest and it's so hard to get there. Uh, what we have found there and what we have learned there from, uh, we found that our children in low income families were most likely to be left out of remote learning and the learning gap seemed to open wider and wider day by day. Well, and there we found that in some schools, a teacher had to organize the teaching and learning activities for grade one to grade six students at the same time in the same class. Moreover, we have found that the ages, the ages of grade one students vary uh, from I can say from seven years old to 13 years old. You can see the size of the student uh, from the picture. So uh, the research that I and my team have been focused on during the COVID-19 pandemic is all about developing reading and writing skills for children. I mean, uh, I can say that uh, teacher's training is also uh, included. Uh, because without these skills, they cannot move on to any other subjects. These pictures are, are also our products. I mean, uh, they are the learning packages using scaffolding techniques to help at-risk students in the rural area. But anyway, you know, sometimes we found that, uh, well, it doesn't work because uh, teachers have to copy a lot of, you know, like pages and they don't have like budget for that. Uh, when all students are forced to become like online learners, and when we talk about teaching innovation, many people will think about technology, but in some areas without Wi-Fi signal, uh, without, without electricity sometimes, innovations can be something very, very simple. It may be not new, but I call it innovation, because we have seen it before, but we have just tried to use it to promote uh, learning for kids. I am talking about the public address system. You can see on the left-hand side, I mean, the picture here. You know, it seems to be very noisy for city people, but in the rural areas, it helped some little kids who couldn't access to education when their school closed uh, due, due, due to the COVID-19. So the public address system model was implemented by using village-based volunteer mechanism. Well, this is a example of the public address system model that we use in Rajburi province. Uh, the volunteers recorded their voice. They, may, they might read uh, tales or some short stories uh, and design the worksheets related to what they have read. Uh, the children, then the children will gather in a small group in the village, listen to the tales or stories from the public address system, and then they would do uh, worksheets with the assistance of, of the volunteer teachers. When I say volunteer teachers, uh, they may be like uh, soldiers or or any other adults in the village. Well, next, uh, this is another form 
of uh, the innovation to promote learning in rural areas when there's no electricity, no internet signal, no public address system sometimes. Uh, this is a transistor, transistor radio. It looks very, very simple, but it can be used with uh, a USB or a handy drive. The children will do exercises uh, in the worksheet after listening to um, the tales or short stories or other contents from a handy drive. This was also a case in a case study in Rajburi province as well. Teachers provided a transistor radio to, to parents and students and demonstrated them how to use it. Well, then preparing teachers for rural classroom, why it matters. Think about rural areas. Uh, what do you see? Maybe fields, forests, mountains, Imagine a rural school in that place. Um, who are the students? What are they learning? Now picture yourself as a teacher there. Are you excited to be there or are you ready to get to work there? Now I can say that this is a lesson learned, you know, from, from the situation of COVID-19 in the rural area in Thailand. Uh, a point to consider for the faculty of education is that what we should provide to our students to make them a knowledgeable, patient, and sacrificial person with good teaching skills. This slide shows three elements uh, we need to focus on for developing the pre-service teachers in the future. Uh, the teacher must be good at subject that they are going to teach. They have to know how to teach well and pedagogy should value diversity like Professor John Williams said. Uh, I want to propose soft skills needed for pre-service teachers, including the last two that uh, I have found from experience uh, from my experience working in rural area context and patient and sacrificial. I think that uh, the faculty of education should help prepare teachers for rural areas. The strategies uh, may include, well, the first one, encourage pre-service teachers to consider rural placements. While many pre-service teachers may not have considered living or, or working in rural places, moreover, uh, almost all faculties of education are often located in, in larger, more urban settings. Our strategy to com combat this is to design rural field experiences uh, so that pre-service teachers meet the students, families, uh, and people in rural communities as well as support understandings of the complexities of place so they can begin to picture themselves working there. And the second one, support the development of a critical understanding about rural places. Quality teacher education should support pre-service teachers in developing their critical thinking skills. Um, existing beliefs must be investigated alongside uh, the historical, uh, cultural, and socio-cultural characteristics that make up any rural community, including issues of race, gender, uh, economics, and beliefs about each place. Uh, when teacher educators uh, provide pre-service teachers uh, with tools to think critically, about place, they support education that helps students understand the wider world and how the norms of their communities compare to other places. I would like to end my presentation with this slide. Uh, no one deserves to be forgotten. We as a teacher educator should not forget to produce uh, quality teachers for our nation, including teachers who can deliver 
quality education in rural areas. Thank you so much. That's very good uh, final words. Thank you so much. Uh, now we're gonna move to the last panelist, uh, Dr. Tang Wee. Please. Okay, mic test, one, two, three. I can hear you. Okay, thank you. All right, so just to make sure that the slides are, everyone can see the full view of the slides? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. It's actually 5.45 in Singapore. So we are one hour ahead. Um, so I'll go, I, I will start my presentation or rather a sharing. Um, I think Singapore has been um, relatively fortunate as compared to um, many other countries in, in this world um, in terms of handling um, and managing the pandemic situation. So we have only, we had one circuit breaker in April, 2020, uh, but since then uh, lessons in schools were mostly conducted in face-to-face -face physical format with uh, safe distancing measures in place. So in this uh, first slide here, I highlight four areas of impact that the pandemic has on teacher education. So first of all, there was a shift from the role of teacher educators as the expert to becoming a learner. When Singapore went into the circuit breaker uh, mode, all of us at the Teacher Education Institute where I work, which is the National Institute of Education, had to resort to using Microsoft Teams, Zoom, and Google Meet to teach. And our student teachers who are pre-service teachers look to us for answers on effective ways to teach online synchronously and asynchronously. But the truth was that we were also learning how to use these virtual tools. And during the pandemic, some school-based um, year-end assessments were removed and the number of topics assessed at national exams were also reduced. The implication of this was that there was more curriculum time. And then again, the teachers came to us and you know, asked, how do we actually feel, fill up this time, this curriculum time that was now freed up? So a lot of people came to us, you know, um, looking for answers to their questions. And we ourselves were trying to figure out what to do at the same time. So in the last two years, um, I also see an emergence of home-based chemistry lab experiments being designed. Uh, why do I say chemistry? Because I train the chemistry uh, teachers. I'm a chemistry educator myself. And, um, you know, in, in, the, in the internet, um, when you just Google, you know, for micro uh, experiments, there are plenty of these uh, home-based experiments. So the characteristics of these home-based experiments is that they tend to be on a micro scale. The experiments tend to be safe. So these activities can be done at home. There was also an emphasis Recording on the mental- stopped. There was also an emphasis on the mental health of teachers as teachers and uh, students were trying to cope with the new norm of teaching and learning with less physical and human interactions. So notably, many in-service calls that required uh, on-site interactions were cancelled in order to avoid inter-school mixing and the possibility of transmission of the virus across the school. But due to this uh, safe distance, distancing measures in place, many of us, um, because we work at the university, we all had to do research we, we couldn't go to schools to collect data in 2020, but we have been lucky to do it uh, whenever the COVID situation uh, improved, when it was under control. Recording course, in progress. Um, but of course, you know, the safe distancing measures were still in place. Uh, some education settings with young children who were not vaccinated are still not open to people outside of the school. So for example, in my um, students' preschool research. My students had to conduct the lesson over Zoom while the preschool teachers who were in the classroom with the students facilitated the lessons. And, but I think that was a very interesting um, experience because we, we have never tried that before. 
usually it's either the teacher teach and we go in as passive researchers and videotape the lessons or that we go in and teach. So this new form of collaboration was rather uh, insightful and, I, and somehow we have found a way to make it work. And the data collection had to be done uh, remotely. Um, at the last minute, you know, all of us had to submit revised um, institutional ethics clearance to conduct interviews over Zoom rather than face-to-face. -face. And I was also involved in some AI study that involved you know, facial recognition. And you know, because facial recognition, if my participants wear masks, obviously is going to reduce the accuracy of the findings. So we resorted to you know, uh, buying uh, plastic masks from online platforms and getting it you know, shipped into Singapore as quickly as possible and have the AI engineers uh, try it out. And but finally, you know, the conclusion was that it still reduced the accuracy um, of the, you know, the precision of the uh, AI findings. And so we, did, we didn't have a choice. We had to make do uh, with, with the kind of findings that we had and to rely more on the eye attention or concentration patterns rather than, you know, uh, the other points on the, on the uh, fa facial features. So that was... Um, uh, some of the changes uh, that, uh, of, you know, how, how it has actually, the pandemic has actually affected uh, my research in particular. So if I may just highlight three um, lessons that I have learned as a science teacher education. The first lesson I've learned is that time and tight weights for no one. For the longest time, even in Singapore, and I recently heard uh, Dr. Ida Mok from Hong Kong saying the same thing, is that, you know, we, we have, um, for the longest time, been trying to push for online learning uh, by providing schools with technology, you know, and, and various kinds of um, e-pedagogies. So one of the positive outcome of this pandemic is that it has catalyzed the use of technology, whether is it in synchronous or asynchronous teaching and learning. The second lesson that I've learned is to believe in the power of the collective. Now, prior to the pandemic, I have traveled and um, I travel a lot overseas to conduct uh, professional development uh, workshops, especially in this uh, region. But due to the travel restrictions, you know, we have no choice, you know, learning has to carry on. And so we found a way to work with the local partners, you know, to ensure that professional development can still be carried out regardless of the time zone and physical boundaries. And so far, we have been lucky um, that um, you know, a lot of our overseas um, outreach work that we are doing with our Thai as well as Indonesian partners have uh, carried on um, very well. And the last lesson, um, third lesson that I've learned is that you know, to borrow a term, uh, flex security, which is a term that was coined by a former prime minister of Denmark in the 1990s, he used this uh, term to describe a dynamic economy that provides security for workers. So during the pandemic, it was, I felt it was important to ensure that number one, the, there must be flexibility in the system to decide on the educational outcomes. It may not be measured by assessment alone. The second one is that there must be a security blanket for teachers and students to adapt to whatever changes that may come without excessive fear that they have lost out. And the third one is that there must be an active policy that are empowering for teachers and students. So if I may just bring back the same uh, example again, one of the policy uh, changes that was made during um, the pandemic was to reduce you know, the amount of content that was being tested in the national exams, as well as to remove uh, some examinations, including the mid-year examinations in all Singapore schools. So I think this is this um, uh, flexi security is important for us as we move into the endemic period of teaching and learning. So with that, I end my uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. You still have time left, but anyway, uh, we can start it. Uh, we have we, we can start a, a discussion okay uh, from all presentations I can see uh, the common themes 
uh, we talk about flexibility, we talk about equality, we talk about equity, we talk about creativity, okay? Uh, I would like you to uh, sh uh, think and share about uh, the flexibility. Is co come with the cost of quality, do you think? I don't really understand. Do you do, do you want us to share about the flexibility that we have got from? Yeah, because in in every context, mm. we try to use a more flexible uh, approach to deal with the problem, right? Uh, the flexibility uh, can may may come with yeah. with with the cost of quality. We cannot do. Uh, we cannot teach, we cannot train the teacher the same way we, di we yes. did, right? But uh, we have to do it online. So that might uh, uh, affect the quality of the teacher or teaching. What do you think? Okay, maybe I take this uh, question first. Um, I, I will try. Well, I, I think the fear of uh, compromising the quality of teaching and learning as a result of um, allowing for more flexibility or rather em empowerment of teachers, um, you know, has a lot to do with this idea of having to standardize a lot of things. So we are very concerned about having to reach the same kind of standards and hence, you know, the standardized exams are such high stakes, um, have such high stakes in, in, in Asia, especially. You know, everyone is so concerned about um, if we remove certain uh, topics, you know, will that mean that our students will learn less? Uh, does that mean that um, our next generation of kids will therefore not have very good grounding in certain content knowledge? We, we want it we want some form of comparison to the previous groups of students who have you know, taken the same kind of standardized exams. In, in the bid to try to see whether you know, um, uh, the accountability is there. So uh, you know, sometimes this kind of accountability systems um, that is highly standardized, you know, um, very concerned with just getting uh, standardized outcomes, has this danger of not being able to cater to things that are happening um, at that point in time, as well as uh, the contextual uh, demands and needs. Um, personally, I'm not, uh, okay, instead of, of thinking that flexibility will compromise the quality, why don't we think um, and, and look at it in a different way, as in whether having this flexibility has allowed for better quality outcomes? that may not be measured in terms of the numbers, but has it perhaps, for example, resulted in teacher empowerment? Has it re resulted in more creative ways uh, of teaching and learning? Has it resulted in teachers caring more for their students? Because, you know, as teacher, I, I was a teacher myself, and it's very easy for us to fall into our comfort zone, teaching the same chemistry content for 10 years, 20 years, without having to, you know, change the way we teach because it has always promised outcomes. But this situation here in, in allowing for flexibility has, has, doesn't give us a choice, right? We are forced in that situation where we now have to think, is this way of teaching and learning the, the best way? Have it actually, it, it maybe it doesn't work now, so let's change. And can we you know, rethink um, you know, whether we can uh, uh, do it better given the current circumstances? So I'll stop here and... Uh, I'll let the other panelists uh, uh, address I, this I, 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 I do remember your presentation uh, about uh, this could be a challenge and also can uh, give uh, the teacher opportunity to be a creative teacher, like trying to find a um, new way of teaching, try to use uh, ICT to enhance um, uh, learning or when you said about uh, the micro uh, experiment in chemistry. I think it's very clear example. Uh, what about others? What do you think about this issue? Well, can, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Can, oh, 
Well, let me share a little bit idea. I mean, I mean, well, something I would like to, sh to share is that to be flexible, maybe we as a teacher, we have to balance the need of us, a teacher, and the need of the students. For example, like this is a, the contents but that the teachers would like to teach, but, but the students have some limitation, like maybe like devices, like uh, if you know that your students have to, some students have to study via, I mean, mobile phone, maybe not a so smart cell phone. Uh, when you design your, um, what should I say, but uh, your materials, you have to make like, you have to think about them. Uh, the font should be big enough for them to read or, or uh, maybe we, we have to engage them, but how to engage them? Maybe students and teachers have to, to communicate more and so that you can, you can know uh, what, so that we can balance our needs and the students' needs. This is my, my, my short comments. Maybe Professor Chan can, elaborate more <laughs> all right please okay well i'm glad um we have this very important question about flexibility in teaching when we are facing about the covid 19 right and i second the professor with idea about you know when we are talking about flexibility we have we also have to consider about the subject issue and also the level of the school i take an example of the taiwan okay we have elementary school middle school high school and college right so for the elementary school they don't have any high school entrance exam or secondary school entrance exam so when you are talking about flexibility for the elementary teachers well teachers are happy Parents are happy, kids are happy. But when you are talking about flexibility for teaching for secondary teacher or high school teacher, they are not happy. Why? Because they have to teach their kids to face the entrance exam. For example, like secondary school kids have to prepare for the high school entrance exam. And the high school kids have to prepare for the college entrance exam. So that's the, we call the standardized, right? Standardized test. So if you are talking about flexibility, teachers, students, and also the parents are afraid their kids may not reach the, the level of the standardized test. So that become a big issue for the secondary teacher and the high school teacher. But if for the college teacher, well, they are happy about flexibility. So that is my first reaction about the flexibility in teaching. You also have to consider about the different level and the different country. The second one is about the subject. When we are talking about flexibility, as I mentioned, if you are teaching mathematics, then the teacher will say, well, because mathematics is one of the major subjects for standardized tests. So they are afraid their student will not be able to then well if you are using the one we call flexibility teaching, right? So that's my response. One you have to consider about the subject and the other one is level of the school. Yeah, thank you. Mm. I kind of wonder that when we reduce uh, the content uh, knowledge uh, to be measured, uh, is it the decision from the Ministry of Education or, or it is like common practice? I just, I just ha have, I have a concern that, okay, if we uh, reduce the content, uh, the, but the e evaluation still the same, uh, we, might, we might face uh, a lot of pain from uh, the parents. Yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, from Taiwan experience, where if we reduce the content for elementary part, it might be okay. Reduce the content for college level, it might be okay. But for middle school and high school, it won't be okay because the parents and students are afraid, right? Are afraid of what, what will be the content of the item in the standardized test or the one we call national-wide test. 
So if we reduce, or some school may not reduce the content, and some school may do something to make up. So that it's become an issue in Taiwan. That's why uh, at my presentation, I said, even though we have the lockdown, but the Ministry of Education still decide to have to carry out the, the whole national exam under lockdown. It's because you know, parents, teachers say, well, even though the whole country is locked down, but all the students have to go to the classroom to take the test. They cannot take tests online because it's cheating issue and also the unfairness issue, something like that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, another, um, okay, we have a lot of um, comments and questions in the, in the chat box. So uh, I'm gonna read them, some of them for you. Uh, this one asks about, uh, can you please a, uh, share with us about your chemistry remote lab? I think this asks uh, Professor uh, Tamri. Yeah, I think this is a question for me. I, I, I did not do the chemistry remote lab, but uh, because we had a candidate um, who was applying for a position in a university. And I remember her, sh um, her, her work. Um, she was actively looking at chemistry remote lab that uses the IoT devices, um, so Internet of Things. Um, so they actually have these uh, sensors that were attached to the um, instruments that was in another country and to remotely collect the data, even though the researchers were not physically in the lab. So they actually did, uh, you know, re-engineered some of the instruments to allow for uh, data collection uh, to continue during the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for your response. Uh, and I think that it would be a great idea if like Ministry of Education can gather uh, a good uh, resources uh, that ready to be used uh, by the teachers. Uh, and and uh, and share with them, okay. Uh, I would like to ask, what are the effect of COVID nineteen on educating students with disability in other countries? She doesn't address uh, to whom this question uh, will be asked, so it can be any one of you. But not me because she is Thai. <laughs> 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 any, uh, any idea, uh, any idea, Doctor Tang Lee? Because uh, from your uh, uh, chat bio, you 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 talk about you you uh, have a lot of experience working with special needs uh, it, uh, student. Okay, my work focuses more on the teachers, uh, but of course we were in the classrooms uh, um, with student, uh, you know, uh, where we have students who have been diagnosed with certain. Uh, special education needs. Um, in Singapore, we also have schools that are catered um, only to students with special education needs. But otherwise, um, we have an inclusive uh, system. So, you know, um, kids with um, special education needs are actually mainstreamed in, in the regular classrooms. Um, during the pandemic, I think it was just last year, I actually conducted, uh, you know, a 13-week course with the teachers in the special needs school. So, I mean, it was, um, you know, that the teachers were um, very interested, very hung hungry for knowledge. And so, despite having to cope with, you know, uh, teaching their students uh, with special education needs, they, they were also, you know, um, invest, they also invested time in their own uh, PD as well. Uh, but, I mean, my, my qualifier here is that, you know, we, we did have a very a well-controlled uh, COVID situation here. So we, we had face-to-face -face lessons with all the safe distancing measures in place. So um, I, I, you know, it, it is a different kind of a situation um, as compared to other places. Um, but of course, during the pandemic, when uh, we had the circuit break breakdown, I mean, circuit breakdown, circuit breaker, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I recall um, there were articles about and sharings about um, children with special education needs having meltdowns at home. And um, it, it, mm -hmm. it's actually quite tiring for, for the par parents who have to work 
at mm -hmm. home and also to take care of the kids with uh, special education needs. Um, but there were resources in place. Um, I, I, I couldn't comment more because I, I wasn't there to, to see uh, uh, for myself. Yeah. Thank you so much. Any other thoughts from other uh, panelists on this? I think um, in the context of the Philippines, uh, we look that as one of our struggles or challenges because uh, we know the fact that teachers are doing really their jobs, particularly on instruction and curriculum. However, at the time of pandemic, we had some struggles in terms of developing instructional materials, most especially for the special education uh, programs. And I think that's something that we need to, to focus more in terms of our directions, not only in terms of strengthening more and capacitating our special education teachers in terms of producing instructional materials that can be supported for remote learning or for flexible learning. There might be, it's really, it's quite difficult, no? Uh, actually, uh, even for, for the formal schooling, we had some difficulties as well in terms of how could we incorporate good materials or instructional materials, even if we're teaching different modalities. Uh, in the special case, we want to consider also uh, the needs of our students as well as with our teachers who will be the one to develop the materials and to ensure quality assurance on that level. Thank you. Yeah. And we have also have a um, uh, kind of comment, uh, flexibility in our ability to, uh, is our ability to adapt to the new normal situation we are in. We have to embrace what is in front of us and perform our duties and responsibilities to make teaching and learning process enjoyable and bring out the best in our uh, learning despite the pandemic. Such a wonderful thought. Uh, this is another question. Can you please share about the assessment during COVID-19 and how can you do how can you do since you have to manage online and how to observe students? Uh, this one asks uh, Professor Chan. Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, give a response to uh, the first question about you know, the student with special needs. The special, I mean, uh, to, um, because some of my um, special education teacher told me they do the individual service. For example, like the hearing impairment, they have to teach kids in person, you know, the hearing impairment. But during the lockdown, all the kids have to stay at home. So the special, I mean, the, the special education teacher, teacher is not allowed to visit kids at home. Okay, so that is a strong impact, strong impact on the student with special needs. So I take hearing impairment as an example. And as I know, a lot of special education kids need individual service or individual teaching in person. So I think the COVID-19 lockdown has a strong impact on students with disability. Okay, and the second question is about how to do the online um, uh, assessment. Well, as I mentioned earlier, for the elementary level and for the college level, it's very flexible. So we give the power and right to teachers so teacher can evaluate student in front of the computer. For example, like art teacher, because my wife is an art teacher. So she asked her student to play violin in front of the computer so she can evaluate a student. But sometimes it has some limitation, for example, another teacher who teach dance. So the student have to dance in front of the computer. So it's, <laughs> it's not easy because you cannot ask students say, hey, st stand still in front of the computer, right? Yeah, so sometimes it's not easy to evaluate a student online, especially for all the performance, okay. 
But if we are talking about, you know, kind of like a standardized test, as I said that for the secondary, for the secondary and the high school, we have to ask students to come to the classroom for the national national wide test because of fairness issue. Yes. So even though some parents say, well, what happens if my kids get affected? You know, then who is going to, you know, uh, who is responsibility for this situation? But it's not easy to get, I mean, to find a balanced way. Right, so that's why I say I don't have the answer to the question about this kind of situation. But so far, we still ask the student to come to classroom to take national national wide test standardized test. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Professor uh, Tang, we uh, share us a link to I think it's an article about it, how AI is used to deter cheating in online exams. I think it's very interesting. And if you have Thank time, you. please, uh, we, I, I, I encourage all of you to uh, have a look. And it has to be uh, the last question because of time limit. Uh, for for Mark, this, this question is for Mark. For the teachers and school head, how do you cope with the challenges we experience in health crisis, especially to those learners who are unprivileged and to those schools and learners who has difficulty to attend classes because of lack of fund to provide their needs. Okay, I think this one, uh, Dr. Udom Lak might uh, answer. Or, or any or any pan panelists, if you have an idea. Yeah, maybe uh, you can start with me. Well, actually in Thailand, mm, we, we also have this problem like, like you, you ask. I mean, maybe the government cannot, uh, you know, like provide enough budget for for every school. And this is so hard. That's why I said that I work with the schools in rural area. So that's why, but, but for like the project that I work for, we have luckily that we have some funding and we have some budget from, from the big uh, foundation. Like uh, I, I mentioned about uh, like equitable education fund. Yes, and, and also we have a, uh, like uh, Princess Mahajakri uh, Foundation, Foundation, and also the Red Cross Society. They help, yeah, the Red Cross. I think that in, in every country there will be like the Red Cross Society, right? Yeah, and for luckily that in Thailand, uh, the Red Cross Society in Thailand, they, they concern a lot about the education in, for, for the schools, especially for the schools in the rural areas during the COVID pandemic. So, so in Thailand, I think that these organizations, I mean, the private sectors come and help, yeah, besides government budget. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is from Thailand. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Uh, perhaps I can give the example um, of what happened in Singapore. Um, you know, there is an old saying, it takes a village to raise a child. So everyone has a role to play when it comes to education. It is not just the job of the policymakers or the schools. Um, so during the pandemic, um, when we all had to go into the circuit breaker in 2020, um, obviously all students needed a, a laptop in order to continue uh, with the synchronous and asynchronous learning. So obviously there was quite a group of uh, students who did not have um, access to personal laptops or that, you know, you may have one laptop in the family, but you have three children yes. and all three children yeah. need a laptop to continue with their yeah. home-based learning. So, you know, where to find, you know, the other laptops. Mm -hmm. So that was when the community, there were efforts within the community to rally Singaporeans to donate their still usable but pre-loved uh, laptops 
And these, um, you know, they rarely support and they delivered these uh, laptops to the homes of uh, these children. The Ministry of Education did that as well. The, the school helped to uh, consolidate, you know, information of uh, children who needed laptops. And these uh, laptops were sent to the homes of um, the children as well. And during the, the uh, circuit breaker, even though, you know, children were told that they would not come to school, but obviously there are parents who are in the healthcare sector, they still need to go to work. So that was where the flexibility comes in again, because you tell all kids to please stay home, but if your parents are healthcare workers, the kids can come to school. Mm -hmm. And they have classrooms where the tables were arranged such that they were far apart. You know, kids continue to have their home base, I mean, continue to learn online on their laptops. There were teachers who still come to school and look after these uh, children. So that was the flexibility in terms of the policy. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so these are, I mean, I will just stop here, just, uh, uh, just to give you some examples of um, how the underprivileged uh, children were taken care of uh, during the pandemic and circuit breaker. Yeah. Okay, uh, we, we, because we have already run out of time, we have to uh, unfortunately end uh, this uh, panel session. And thank you so much, uh, all panelists, for your insightful uh, thought and comments. I think uh, we have uh, the light at the tun tunnel uh, because of uh, your example and your, um, your, 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 your thinking, okay? And um, thank you so much, our audience, uh, for participation uh, in this uh, 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 panel discussion. And I hope to see you all again tomorrow because this is uh, the first just so the first day of the conference. We still have another day. The other day we left tomorrow. So uh, I am Pumbapan Pung So Pon. Thank you so much. And I'm signing off. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very bye -bye. much. Bye -bye. Recording stopped.